Hello and welcome to the 13th episode of the Highlighter Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Isero. I'm very excited to have you all back if you have listened to the Highlighter Podcast before. And if it's your first time, welcome to the show. The Highlighter Podcast is where you, the loyal subscribers of the Highlighter, get to talk about the issues and articles that you care about most. Well, I'm totally excited to let you know who's on the show today. Our guest is Lauren Markham, and she is an educator in Oakland, and she's also a reporter and writer. Lauren is the author of The Girl Gangs of El Salvador, which was the lead article in the Highlighter 110, and also the author of the new book, The Faraway Brothers. We're going to be talking about her article and her new book, and we're also going to be talking about what it takes to serve immigrant youth, and specifically newcomer immigrant youth, in these difficult challenging, uncertain times. I hope that you totally enjoy the interview. Well, hi, Lauren. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hi, thanks so much. I'm really, really honored to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm totally excited to talk to you about a number of things, but first for the audience out there, could you um, talk a little bit about yourself and your role in Oakland, as well as a little bit more about your work as a writer and a reporter? Yeah, absolutely. So I am what's called a community school manager um, in the Oakland Unified School District at a school called Oakland International, which is a high school for 100% newly arrived immigrant youth. Um, it's a public school within the OUSD. Um, and my role there is sort of the administrator in charge of um, coordinating and overseeing non-academic programs, so sort of socio-emotional programs that support um, young people and families kind of outside of the classroom so that they can be more successful inside <laughs> the classroom. Um, and in addition to that, I'm also a writer. Um, I'm a fiction writer, actually, uh, but most Recently, in the past several years, um, I've been working a lot on journalism, and so I write articles, mostly long-form articles, and I recently, two weeks ago, um, published a book called The Far Away Brothers, which is a kind of joins my writing work and my work at the school. It's a nonfiction chronicle of um, two young men, unaccompanied minors, who were students at Oakland International High School and their journey kind of leaving violence-riddled El Salvador and coming to the United States. And by the way, I just finished it, and it's fantastic. And I just want to talk about—I want to talk about that as well. But before that, um, you know, the, the in the audience there's a lot of educators and also people who care about young people. And I'm just really intrigued about also how you got to this work, um, specifically uh, in Oakland, and also with mm -hmm. the non-academic piece. And it seems like you've had a couple sort of steps along the way and and now you're really centered in on a group of students that even though the bay area has you know so like a, a number of them i i feel mm -hmm. like in many ways that we're not totally focusing on them so how did you get mm -hmm. to where how did you get here yeah so um it's a great question i've always been really passionate about education um i in, have always worked with and enjoyed working with young people and particularly adolescents and so um, you know, throughout even high school, college, after college, I was working um, in education programs, teaching summer school, and um, I worked at an independent school in Vermont throughout college. I would teach math in the morning um, before my own classes a few days a week. Um, but I had this amazing opportunity to study in Uganda um, when I was in college for a semester, and um, it was there that I was sort of introduced to forced migration issues and uh, refugee issues because it's a hub for migration in East Africa. Uganda is a hub for forced migration in East Africa and throughout the Horn of Africa. And it's sort of surrounded by um, a lot of countries who've been, you know, had intense conflicts that have forced people from their homes in recent years. So I, that's where I sort of started thinking about education and, and, and migration and the sort of overlap between those two. And so um, when I, after I graduated college, it's like 11 years ago, um, I, 12 years ago, something like that, I um, began working at the International Rescue Committee as an AmeriCorps member. So I was, um, I was essentially like an assistant caseworker supporting newly arrived refugees who'd come to the United States under the auspices of the U.S. refugee program. And because I, 
had such a passion for working with young people and because we were such a bare bones staff, it sort of fell on me um, and, and I took it on very enthusiastically to be supporting families to enroll their kids in school and to find the right school placement for them. And I was noticing during that time that a lot of young people who were coming in at the high school level were um, ending up dropping out of school because there just weren't always the the best resources to help them learn English, catch up to grade level, and get all of the credits that they needed to graduate. Um, and even in really fantastic school programs, it's just they arrive late and um, facing a ticking clock. That was when the Casey still existed, so they had to pass the Casey exam. And a lot of students would just sort of figure that it wasn't going to work out for them. Their families needed money, so they drop out and work. And that same year, Oakland International High School happened to be in the process of, of opening. So I was on the planning committee at Oakland International High School um, and just totally fell in love with the educators and the mission of the school. Um, and so I was a community partner from even before day one. Um, and I worked for several nonprofits. I worked for Refugee Transitions. I worked as a consultant for the Oakland School District. Um, and then finally, about a few years ago, as the district was launching its community school initiative, um, I started, they offered me that job, which was great. So I, I sort of get to work in education, but I sort of realized over the course of that time that I love working in the education context, but um, that my passion is really about connecting students to services and providing systemic, sustainable resources on campus um, to support education kind of like around the academic setting. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you're working with uh, young people directly, and you're also working with their families and also the system. But you also happen to have time to to write, and which which I find pretty amazing. And so I guess my question is sort of how did you find this way from fiction to nonfiction? Why are you mm -hmm. writing these? Why are you writing these stories? And then also how is it possible given that there's only 20 yeah. hours in a day? Especially because yeah. your work your work isn't just writing, it's also the reporting, which I just find right. totally, totally fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, well, so I should say I'm part-time at the school. I've been working for the past several years, four days a week, um, and they've been very generous with me around taking, you know, keep taking comp time or taking time off during the summer. I'm a 12-month employee, but um, I've definitely done a lot of the reporting and the writing, like, over, like, Thanksgiving break, mm -hmm. over the winter break, over spring break. Um, and in the summer and trying to kind of cram in time. So at the same time, it was definitely um, a really big challenge, especially to write this book. It was just sort of felt like I was working 24 seven. I would come home at the end of a long day at the school and sort of have to switch to writing. Most weekends I spent writing. It definitely was a challenge, but again, um, I do want to, you know, name that I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't at the school every single day of the week, um, which helped. Um, and that flexibility really helped. And the way I made my way from fiction, I mean, I had written nonfiction a lot in college. I had sort of switched and gotten my, ma my MFA focusing on fiction. But I, I finally sort of, I almost like fell into journalism by accident because I realized that journalism was a way to like make beautiful sentences, which is what, or, you know, in my aspiration to make beautiful sentences um, and be able to write in, in a writerly way about things that really mattered to me. And I also realized the more sort of locally, I, I sort of started in the, in, in the migration and education world, I sort of started from like almost a global policy perspective. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I sort of had maybe sort of vague aspirations like when I was in college or right after of like, maybe I would live as an expat and help do education policy for refugees in other countries. And ultimately, you know, I might not to knock those professions at all, but for me, it felt like that was a little bit like that would have, what did I know about the education context in another country? Like what role did I have there? I really found my place was like supporting families to integrate into the country that I was from and the place where I was raised and where I went to school and where I live. And that that was just a better role for me than sort of this like, um, I could picture this sort of more paternalistic thing happening if I if I just moved somewhere else. Um, so, but that made me drill down and really be working on a very very local level, right? Like in Oakland, in the OUSD, at this one high school, and I still had all of these global questions. Um, sort of like, okay, I'm having all of these students from Yemen coming. What's that about? Like, I have all these unaccompanied minors coming. What's that about? And so, it was this journalism was this way for actually actually to answer some of the questions that came up in my work um, that were relevant to my work, but not necessarily uh, what I was working on day to day in the school. It was sort of like the backdrop or the, the it was kind of like tracing that line backward to the source um, to understand, to understand my students better and also just like the world better. 
And I see that in your work as well, both in Girl Gangs as well as in the Faraway Brothers. You go back and Mm -hmm. forth from the young person or people, and then you go bigger to the overall system, and then you come back and forth. It's just what I what I really love, though, is that how you center in on young people and it's this combination. And it may be from your fiction background as well, but you totally humanize them, obviously, and you allow enough space for them to tell their story. Is it okay if I ask Mm. you a little bit about Girl Gang, specifically about Elena? Of course. Yeah, of course. It it just seems that you I, I want to know more about how you got to meet her, if you can say that. But specifically mm-hmm. also, like, what do you do in your writing and reporting to get to know somebody? I, I just feel like you spend a lot of time and you don't have any specific um, uh, you don't have any specific conclusions from the outset. Can you say a little bit mm-hmm. more about her? Yeah, well, I'm a little bit hesitant to just name the specifics of how I met her only because she's anonymous, but I can so, so I wouldn't want to kind of like out that, but um, what I can say is that just I, th- your questions are great. And I think the, that what I do is I just like approach the questions that I have and the person that I'm talking to with like a genuinely open heart. I'm genuinely curious, like about, like my questions come from a genuine place of curiosity and I work really hard to be sort of like respectful and careful um, and vulnerable myself. And I think that that's also really relevant in the education context, right? Like anytime we think we know better um, than someone else about something, we're almost always proven wrong, especially when we think we know something about them that they don't know. Like that's just, that's just, that's, you know, talk about paternalism. Um, so I really like approach people when I'm talking to them with this genuine curiosity, like they are there to teach, like they are not, they don't exist to teach me, but I am approaching them with like the lens of a student saying, I have questions. And if you're willing to answer them, I'm willing to be like an open hearted listener and really trying to understand. Um, So I think that that's sort of the most important, the most important facet of, of, uh, of interviewing people and sort of, um, and, and it's also time, right? Like, you have to sort of prove that you're trustworthy and that requires an investment of time, not a like, okay, I'm going to have one conversation with you. Tell me everything about your whole life. Right. Like that sort of is a vulture approach where I'm just going to like pick over the wreckage of your difficult story. Like, no, I really, really genuinely want to invest the time to get to know people and their stories um, and to hear from them what they think is important and relevant about their experiences um, that, that, that should be shared. Yeah, I mean, as a reader of the piece, obviously, what I was thinking about, too, is that I may I may know about some issues of of, uh, of sort of gangs in El Salvador as well as here. And then also I might know about the murder or homicide rate. But in this piece, you're talking about femicide as well and specifically mm-hmm. um, what happens with with young women. And is that something that you sort of knew about going in or is it something that you sort of unearthed uh, as a result of doing the reporting? I definitely knew about it going in, but it was also something that I kind of continued to hear about and learn more about and therefore have more questions about, um, which made me want to write the piece. Like I hadn't really seen much about, so, so it's like there was a lot of data out there that I was very familiar with even before I started reporting this book around like, you know, I mean, look, it's it's the vast majority of people who, who are killed are actually young men, um, but young women um, are in a in in are very, very vulnerable to gang violence. Um, and I'd read a lot of the statistics about, you know, the the women who are t- who are forced into relationships with gang members, the fact that the arrest rates um, had gone way up for for women, the fact that young women every year seem to be fleeing El Salvador more and more, like the number of women versus, so like among unaccompanied minors or or young people who come to the United States by themselves, the proportion that were women, young women were going, was going up every year. So I knew these statistics, but it was like, okay, in this context, I, my question, my genuine question was like, what does that mean for young women? What are their options and what do they do? And so that piece was kind of about like what their options are. And one is, is fleeing. One is, um, one is, uh, risking being killed by the gangs and just living your life. And another one is actually joining the gangs to join the power structure that's, that's oppressing them and, and, and others, um, other young, mostly low income people in El Salvador and throughout Central America. So, yeah, I, yeah. I noticed, I noticed that also in your writing, especially if you compare, 
um, the article along with the book, you're crystal clear on what these young people face and what their options actually are. And, and when they mm-hmm. do choose to leave, what the consequences are as well. Um, and I and I see it also in how you sort of begin the book, The Faraway Brothers, um, with the two brothers, Ernesto and Raul. And they also, even though they're twins and and they're totally inseparable, they're each individuals and they each individually uh, have some choices. And even though they're different, they find out that that they make the choice that, that they make. And mm-hmm. what I was struck by is is how similar the choices are and how constrained the choices um, are as well. And uh, did you notice that as well? Is that something that hit you? For young women and for young men, you mean? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, no no one's in a good situation uh in, in no one caught up in the gang stuff in El Salvador um, or throughout the Northern Triangle is in a good situation, including the gang members, right? Like that's another important thing to remember is that I don't just want to vilify the gang members. It, 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 like actually a lot of gang members are just young people who've been swept up in this by force or by force of circumstance. Yeah. And also you touch upon, which I think a lot of people don't know about, but the the actual U.S. involvement in sort of the creation and the building up of of these gangs and this idea Mm -hmm. that that with the Civil War and then also with the uh, mass migration, as well as the deportation and all of that fed into what what we're what we're seeing now. And yet there's still this sense. I mean, you, you capture it really beautifully, just the the sense of El Norte as this place that somehow is going to be different, you know, for young people, especially um, given that that the violence that they're seeing um, in El Salvador is, is, is so, um, so challenging. And mm-hmm. the thing is, like, in your work, is that also a piece that you're trying to drive home, which is, hey, Americans we have to actually know what's going on because the gangs are not an other and like El Salvador is not this faraway place. Is that also a piece of your work? Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, we're, we're living in a globalized world. And so on the one hand, we have globalized trade. We have like global policies uh, in multiple, in multiple ways, right? Like we're connected and linked more than ever to other parts of the world and certainly to our, you know, direct neighbors or nearby neighbors. Um, so the, the fact is what happens in El Salvador affects us and it has for years. If there's a hurricane in El Salvador, an earthquake in El Salvador or a volcano erupts in El Salvador, which have all happened, that drives people to the North or that impacts trade or that, right? So like, this idea that we can operate in isolation from other countries that we're linked to in these inextricable ways um, is kind of absurd. Yeah. And I was also thinking, have you been asked about, because I work with teachers who actually have their students read Enrique's journey. Have you been yeah, asked it's a great book. about, I mean, have you been asked sort of how your, um, how your book sort of adds on to, uh, to Enrique's journey? You know, I have not specific. I was sort of asked that when we were trying to um, get the book published, um, but I haven't. You're the first one to ask that recently, and it's a really great question. Enrique's Journey is a completely fabulous book, um, and you know, it's like uh, Sonia Nazario is a total uh, journalist hero. Um, the thing is, Enrique's Journey, I believe, was I can't remember if it was published in 2006 or took place in 2006, but it was the early 2000s. Enrique and people in his circumstance were leaving their country because of poverty and to reunite with family. Um, Of course, there was violence, and she talks a little bit about community violence there, but the main issues was endemic poverty, and right, Enrique goes searching for his mom. He wants to reunite with his mom, and that is more of a pull factor, right? He's being pulled to the United States, and my book chronicles much more recent migration in which People are, of course, there are still the pull factors of poverty, um, you know, leave it, trying to, to find economic opportunity and, and reuniting with family. Um, about 2 million foreign-born Salvadorans live in the United States, and the country of El Salvador is 6.6 million people. So, right, like, almost everyone in El Salvador has somebody close to them who lives in the United States or who has gone to the United States. Um, 
So my book, though, is much more about these push factors, things that are pushing them out of their countries to the United States. And so it actually is quite a different dynamic. So it is almost like, in, in a way, it's like an evolution. Um, and, and it's kind of like, in a way, it could be seen as like a chapter two to this very similar dynamic that both of our books are talking about. But, but mine um, is talking about more current circumstances because it's a newer book. Um, yeah, so that's what I'll say about that. Yeah, and I totally actually see my colleagues um, assigning your book, not just because it's more recent, but mm. I think it's more true to what's ex exactly happening now for unaccompanied minors. And, right. And yet, you know, I, I did teach in San Francisco for, for 12 years, and I just remember, and this was before the most recent, you know, five or six years, but mm -hmm. I still remember, I still remember my students um wanting me to get to know them more than what I and also my colleagues would just generally do naturally. And I feel like this book is also a way for educators, not just in the Bay Area, but across the country, to get to know their students more and also to be able to ask more questions in the same way that you ask uh, your questions in your work as well in your, in your writing. My question is, why, I mean, why do you think why do you think it might be true that some educators may not want to go there and white educators specifically may not want to actually maybe ask questions or get to know their students mm. past a more surface level? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, you know, I, can't, I, I have some theories. I think that there are some different circumstances that, that could be at play here. I think um, we're not always trained to ask questions and be uh, vulnerable to the notion, especially as teachers who are like supposed to be all knowing and some weird conception of, of education. Um, it's a vulnerable thing to say, wow, there's so much I don't know. And this young person has so much to teach me. Um, I think that that is a completely vital stance for an educator. I think that all educators should be open and receptive and, um, and sort of assume that their that their students know a lot more than they do on many on many topics uh, first and foremost about themselves the students um, I also think that these things are intense um, and I think that um, it can be vulnerable like especially if you have students who are um, you know have major behavior challenges um, it's much easier to say to have a stance um, whether it's explicitly stated or it's sort of implicit in your in your mind or heart that it's like this is a bad kid this bad kid is doing this bad thing um, it's easier to feel that than to be like huh what is it in this student that in the student's past or present experience that is causing this or motivating this behavior and what am i doing to make it better what am i doing to make it worse so it sort of it requires a reframing of the question um that you know uh, and this is just if it's an, if there's behavior issues. I don't want to say that like all newcomers have behavior issues. They don't. But like the young people in my book have a lot of trauma that they're bringing to the table, and so they drank at school. They had a lot of you know back talking and frustration with teachers in their classroom. And um, it's really hard when a student's being challenging to sort of turn the mirror on yourself and be like, okay, what can I do to fix this? Or what? What is my part in this? How do, how do I make this better? Not fix, but how do I how do I how do I do the best I can do uh, in service of the student? Yeah, and you make a good point also that teachers may have a gap between wanting to do the right thing as well as wanting to be the one in the know to have the answers, mm -hmm. but maybe not feeling equipped. And I feel like maybe there's a little fear there as well. So even though you know we may want to be there for all students, maybe we don't know exactly how to do it. And specifically, um, I wanted to ask you about the DACA repeal and mm -hmm. what, what you can tell uh, educators in the Bay Area. What, you know, for example, what are you doing mm -hmm. at your school? But what, is, what are some uh, opportunities or what are some things that, that you think that teachers should be thinking about right now in this totally uncertain time? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think first and foremost, just being aware of like, this is an uncertain time. And that is a very triggering thing, both for young people who uh, are DACA recipients themselves or who have DACA, you know, recipients in their family or in their close community. But even so, actually, none of the students at my school are DACA recipients, because to be a DACA recipient, you have to have been here since 2007. And all of my students are newcomers. So um, they they don't and, and wouldn't qualify. Um, but that that said, 
it, it's still the thing about the uncertainty of DACA is it's basically a message to young immigrants around like even those of you who did all the right things and went through this paperwork process and 95% of you are either in school or working or both. Like even you guys are, 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 are potentially on the chopping block and your life is hanging in the balance. And so that just sends a general message to the immigrant community of, of uncertainty and, and unwelcome in the United States. Um, So, so I just think being aware of, of the fact that this is, this can be a really traumatic moment and a really traumatic time and that uncertainty like this just can impact us in, 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 can impact people in really intense ways. Um, And in terms of uh, what educators can do, I mean, I think that people at their, I think it's really important, like I am not an attorney, um, and so I don't want to give legal advice. I think that um, we're tempted as educators sometimes to like solve students' problems and so to say you should do this or you shouldn't do that. In the Bay Area especially, there are, and, and all throughout the country, there are amazing legal resources, people who can come in and do workshops for DACA or who can advise your staff on what to tell students. And so I really recommend that schools and educators reach out and find those partners um, who, who are experts in this, who, who can help. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention just um, to your question before is that I, I think that um, I think that when, like, being open and vulnerable and uh, receptive to, to, to learning about students is so vital. I just wanted to also name, though, that like asking tons of questions isn't actually always the way the best way to be receptive that can actually feel like an assault to students. And so I think that sometimes I see incredibly well intentioned educators sort of grill students about their past and the students may or may not actually be ready to have those conversations. So being open and receptive doesn't necessarily mean interviewing students about their life experience. You know, I think if any of us just meet someone for the first time or don't know someone very well and then they say, where are you born? What was the hardest thing that ever happened in your life? Where do you come (laughs) from? What do you want for your future? Where's your mom? Where's your dad? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, you know, even more so for for young people. So just something to keep in mind. Totally. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, it's definitely a balance. And educators always want to do the right thing. And yet it's important to sort of really be thinking and metacognitive and reflective about what we're doing. So thank you so much totally. for that. I have to say, though, Lauren, that we are sadly out of time. I could totally just keep mm-hmm. on asking awesome. you questions. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. You know, this is a this audience is building. And uh, so I'm excited that you're on the show to be able to share your writing and your work and just um, all the great work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate having me on. It's very cool to talk to fellow educators. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate what you're doing here. I want to thank Lauren Markham yet again for coming on the show. I think she's wonderful and I'm a big fan of her writing. And so if you have not yet read The Girl Gangs of El Salvador, which appeared in number 110, definitely go over there and check it out. And if you like it, I highly recommend her new book, The Faraway Brothers. I think it's definitely something to check out. I will also say that the way that I found out about Lauren was with an article that I read by her last year at around this time. And the title of that article um, is Our School, and it appeared in the Orion magazine, and it totally blew me away. All right, it's almost time to get out of here, but just one more thing before I close. On Thursday of this last week, we had the first ever in real life gathering of the Highlighter community, and it was called the Highlighter Happy Hour, and it was over at Room 389 in Oakland, and it was a total success. Lots of people came out, and we chatted, we met people, and also we talked a little bit about the articles. People want to do it again, and so I think I'm going to be putting it up on highlighter.cc slash events probably in the next month, so be looking for that. I think it's going to be a pretty great way to just continue talking about the issues and the articles that we care about. As always, I'm trying to make this podcast better, and so please let me know what you think. Is it getting better? Is it getting there? You can email me at mark at highlighter.cc with any sort of warm and cool feedback. I definitely want to improve this podcast for you. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you again for listening to the Highlighter podcast. I hope that it's supercharged your Monday commute. 
And I will see you, I guess, over on the newsletter at Thursday morning at 9.10, and then here back again, ready for the Monday commute next Sunday night at 9.10 p.m. Have a great week.